Uh, I would love for you to open your Bible with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. And if you don't have a Bible and you want one, we have some on our little welcome table back there. We would love for you to have one of those and read along with us. Um, and let me mention a couple things while you're turning to 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, we just today concluded our adult Sunday school class through the Gospel of Mark. Next week, we're going to start the book of Ephesians. And so if you've not attended adult Sunday school, let me just extend that invitation to you again. We meet back in the classrooms behind this building here from about 8.45 to 9.45. Unfortunately, we don't offer childcare, but your children are welcome to join us in class. And if you can't make it, we record those sessions and we do publish them on our podcast, uh, just Maricopa Springs. So you can listen to those. The audio quality is not always the best, but um, if you want to get a little bit more in-depth teaching, that is available to you. And then one other thing, next week, right after the service, right out here, we're going to do a baptism. We have a couple of folks who have expressed their desire to be baptized, and so we're going to celebrate that with them as a church. And if you have not been baptized, but you are a follower of Jesus and you've given your life to him, then I want to invite you to get baptized. Uh, so if after the service you're interested in being baptized next week after church, come chat with me just so that I can give you some basic details. And for those of you who are getting baptized next week, um, I will be in touch with you this week to just go over those logistic details with you as well. Let's read 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 16 through 17. The Apostle Peter writes, Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Man, sometimes when I uh, start studying for a, a text, I look at like two verses and I'm like, there's not going to be like 30 minutes of content. And then by the time I'm done with the studying, I'm like, how do I make this in under 40 minutes of content? Before we really jump into a close look at these verses, I just want to remind you of what we learned last week that we covered in verses 13 and 14. Peter told us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13, that as Christians, it is God's will that we would obey the governing authorities that he has placed over us. And we obey the governing authorities as Christians because we have confidence that God is in control. These people are not in authority just because of elections or revolutions or whatever other uh, reasons might lead to them being in charge. They are in the authority that they have because God has ordained that they be there, because God is the ultimate authority. We also touched on the fact that for us as Christians, our primary citizenship is not in this world. We are not first and foremost Americans. We are children of God. We belong to the kingdom of God. That is a kingdom that is established even here and now, even though you cannot see it with your eyes. And it is running parallel to the kingdoms of man. But we are citizens of that kingdom, children of God. And yet, even though that is true, we remain obligated to obey the authorities that God has established for his perfect purposes. Now, all of that prepares us for verse 16, where we are told then that we should live as people who are free, not using our freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Now, I think that what happens between verse 15 and verse 16 is a subtle shift from a political perspective to a spiritual perspective. Peter was talking about political things in verses 13 and 14, things like emperors and governors. These are men and women, potentially, who rule and reign over nations. But here in verse 16, when he uses the word freedom, he's not talking about politics. And it's important you understand this. He's rising above politics. Let me explain what I mean. In America, when we talk about freedom, what things come to mind? Freedom of speech, 
You know, the Second Amendment, the freedom of association. We think about the kinds of freedoms that are spelled out for us in our Bill of Rights or the Constitution. But those are political realities. That's not actually what Peter has in mind here as he talks about freedom. Let me flip it around and I'll give you another perspective to hopefully help you understand what I'm talking about. Take a country like China. China is not at all a free country in the way that we might say America is a free country. Even though China technically has a constitution that spells out some of the same things that we enjoy as freedoms in America. But in China, you don't have the freedom of speech. You don't have the freedom to own a gun. You don't have the freedom to associate with whoever you choose. So then what does verse 16 mean for somebody who lives in China? Live as people who are free. Are they free? Well, they're not free in a political sense, and that's what I'm getting at. Peter is not now talking about politics. They are free in the spiritual sense. And so a Christian in China is free indeed in the way in which Peter is discussing freedom. Verse 16 still applies to them. So all Christians have this freedom which Peter is talking about no matter what kind of government they might be subject to. In John chapter 8, verse 36, Jesus says, If the Son of God sets you free, then you will be free indeed. This is the kind of freedom that Peter is talking about. He's reminding us that whoever might be governor or emperor in this world, we as Christians belong to a higher kingdom a transcendent kingdom where God has set us free from the things that truly oppress mankind. You know, our biggest problem as people is not that governments oppress us. No, it's that we are oppressed by sin and evil. And so Peter encourages us as Christians to live according to our identity, not thinking of ourselves as citizens of any particular country, but thinking of ourselves as those who are free because we belong to the kingdom of God. We are children of God and citizens of his divine kingdom. Now that's a wonderful, hopeful, optimistic, joyful, beautiful reminder, isn't it? When you look around at the kingdoms of this world and you see the amazing skill with which governors and rulers ruin everything, isn't it a wonderful joy to look past the misery created by those who rule and reign over the nations of this world and look past them to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, that we can rejoice that the Son of God has set us free to live in his kingdom where we have access to everlasting joy and peace and hope eternal. Now, since Peter tells us that we are people who are free and that we should use our freedom to serve God, I think that this is going to require us to have a kind of detailed discussion about what the Bible means when it uses this word freedom. What does the Bible teach about freedom? See, again, Peter is not saying that we have freedom like Americans have freedom, rights, and that kind of thing. Peter's talking about a spiritual reality. And since there's a lot of confusion about what freedom is, I think we'll benefit from looking at this more closely. Let me try and clear some of that confusion up. When we hear the word freedom we tend to think about the right to do whatever we want. Liberty, to do what pleases us. That's the modern view of freedom, isn't it? In fact, if you just Google the word freedom, the first definition that comes up there says, freedom is the power or right to act, speak, or think as one wants without hindrance or restraint. Freedom means you can marry whoever you want, 
You can dress whoever, however you want. You can be whatever gender you want. You can do whatever drugs you want. You can spend your time however you want. You can say whatever you want. You can live however you so choose. That's what sort of the typical definition of freedom is as people think about it. Nobody can tell you how to live your life. You do you because you are free. So let's try and insert that definition into verse 16. Ready? It might sound like this. Live as people who have the right to do whatever you want, not using your freedom to do whatever you want as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Now, when I insert that definition into the verse and read it like that, doesn't it sound absolutely nonsensical? It doesn't work. Mostly because of the very last phrase there that commands us to live as servants of God. If we're truly servants of God, we're not free to do anything that we want. We must do what our master wants us to do. That's what it means to be a servant. This, the word servant here, actually, maybe you already know this, or maybe your Bible footnotes it. It's the Greek word doulos, and it really means slave. We don't like that word as Americans because we've got an ugly history with slavery. And so we tend to translate it as servant. But by definition, a slave is not free to do whatever he wants. And isn't it fascinating? Do you notice what Peter does here? Peter, in the very same verse, can use the word freedom and slave. In the very same verse, he can say, you are free, therefore live as a slave. And this brings us to our Christian definition of freedom. For us as Christians, freedom is to be like God. To be free is to be like God. To be full of goodness and truth and righteousness. That's what real freedom looks like. Spiritual freedom is not found in doing whatever you want. It is found in doing what God commands. Is that how you think about freedom? See, evil has twisted this all around. Evil has convinced us into believing that righteousness is dull. Righteousness is boring. Righteousness is restricting. And sin, oh, that's thrilling. Sin is really exciting. Sin is where all the action is. Sin is where freedom is to be found. But you know, when Adam and Eve ate that fruit in the garden and they disobeyed the clear command of God, they sold all of humanity into slavery. They didn't set us free. They bound us up. Again, the words of Jesus from John 8 are helpful here. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. And so, listen, the problem with humanity is that we are enslaved to sin because we practice sin. And when the world says ridiculous things like people should be free to just do whatever they want, Right? I'm a libertarian. Let people just do whatever they want. What they're really saying is that people should be even more enslaved to the sinful passions of their flesh than they already are. And so once again, let me say that the ability to do whatever you want, that is not freedom. You need to get that definition out of your head. If that's how you think of freedom, you need to reject that definition because that is totally unbiblical, ungodly. When the human heart has the ability to do whatever it wants, do you know what it does? It goes immediately towards self-destruction. It naturally chooses sin and evil and rebellion against God. And if you always choose sin and evil when you have a choice, then... You're a slave to sin. And don't you see, this is part of the reason why our society is collapsing in on itself. 
Because more and more people believe that freedom means you should just be able to do whatever you want. And that always leads humanity further away from peace and joy in the presence of God and deeper into ruin. Let me quote Martin Luther, that German monk. He says, It is plainly proved by Scripture that Satan is by far the most powerful and crafty prince of this world. Under his rule, the human will is no longer free in its own power, but the slave of sin and Satan, and can only will what its prince has willed. And he will not let it will any good. Though even if Satan did not rule the human will, sin itself, whose slave man is, would weigh it down enough to make it unable to will good. Here is unbelief, disobedience, sacrilege, blasphemy towards God, cruelty and mercilessness towards one neighbor, and love of self in all the things of God and of man. Here you have the glory and potency of free will. Now, in contrast to the false freedom of sin, Peter reminds us of the good news that we've received in verse 16. By faith in Jesus Christ, we've become servants of God, slaves of God. We're set free from slavery to sin. We're set free from slavery to sin, not just to go out and be a free agent of our own and do whatever we want. No, we've traded in slavery to sin for slavery to God. And Peter says that we should live as slaves of God. And when he says we should live as slaves to God, he's saying we should be free. Because that's what freedom looks like. So here's a question for you. Do you ever feel burdened by shame? Do you ever feel as if your life is out of control? Do you ever feel as if you can't master yourself? Do you ever regret the things that you do? And after regretting them, wish that you could do different? Well, turn to Christ. Become a slave of Jesus. No longer a slave of sin, doing your own self-destructive will. Become a servant of God, and if the Son of God sets you free, Jesus promises you will be free indeed. No longer will your choices continue to take you down that same route, that same path of despair and self-hatred and misery and ruin and destruction and shame. Instead, your choices being free in Christ to obey Him can lead you towards life and joy and peace and hope. So the freedom that Peter speaks of here in verse 16, it's freedom from condemnation that comes from sin. Freedom from that voice in you that says you're just a crummy piece of crap and you're never going to do anything better. You could be free from that. Freedom from condemnation. Freedom from the dominion of sin that says that it must rule over you. You can be free because Christ can set you free indeed. True freedom to do the will of God from a willing heart to please God, to have your will align with God's will so that you flourish in his grace the way that God created people to live. Now after encouraging us to live as people who are free, Peter goes a step further to tell us not to use our freedom as a cover-up for evil. Now within the context of of ruling authorities within that subject, this means that we cannot say that because I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God, I no longer have to obey the authorities of this world. See, the temptation could be for us as Christians to look at the governing authorities and focus on their incompetence and their evil and their ignorance and say, look, I serve God, so I don't have to do anything this dude says. But Peter tells us not to use our freedom in Christ to cover up the evil of disobeying the command of God to submit to the authorities that God has put over us. 
And we talked about this last week. We looked at Romans 13 as another example of where Scripture teaches that we should be subject to the authorities. Why? Because God is the one who appoints those authorities. And we are free, but our freedom makes us servants of Christ. And Christ, in his sovereign wisdom, would have us submit to the authorities of this world. And so we obey Christ. We don't use our freedom as a cover-up for evil. But let's think for a second about a further application maybe for this teaching. Do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. I would say that the biggest secondary application here would be uh, fighting against antinomianism. Do you know this word, antinomianism? There are some people who claim that because we have received grace from God and we are set free from the condemnation of sin, we can then go live our lives however we want, right? Because if I sin, what happens? I get grace. And so it doesn't really matter how I live. But do you see the terrible definition of freedom creeping its way back in again? There it is. These are people who call themselves Christians who use their Christian freedom and the grace that God gives them to actually advocate for doing sin. In other words, I'm free from condemnation so I can go sin as much as I want versus I'm free, therefore I should go live like Christ. Since God's grace will cover our sin, we don't need to obey Jesus. That's what these people would claim who are antinomian. And this is using the freedom of Christ as an excuse to do evil. And we already talked about how as Christians, that's simply not possible if we are servants of God. A good servant obeys the commands of his master. And so because we are free, let us hate sin. Let us wage war against sin when it manifests itself in our hearts and our lives. Let us not make excuses for the evil that we do. Let us turn away from evil. And as servants of Jesus Christ, then let us seek to please God in everything that we do. Now, I already alluded to this, but isn't there some wonderful irony in verse 16? Peter tells us that we are people who are free. And what does it mean to be free? It means that you are a slave of Christ. And friends, this is an essential point of Christian theology that you need to understand if you are a Christian. True human freedom is found in being a servant of God. To serve any other master brings terrible bondage. To serve your passions or your desires, to serve an idol, to serve an earthly master, to serve your lust or your money or your fame or your beauty, none of those things bring freedom. To serve any of those masters is to give your soul over to chains of slavery where you will be used and abused. And ultimately, that thing will never give you what it promises. It will only take and ruin and destroy. Those masters are evil tyrants. They want to rule and control you. They're hungry for your destruction. Whereas if you submit yourself to Christ as a willing servant, you find freedom and life. And so all of the promises of our modern age that man can liberate himself from all the constraints and be free, those are lies. If you have been believing those things, you have been believing lies. And the soul is only free when it's a slave to Christ. And what does that freedom look like? It looks like obedience. The Bible teaches that if you have been saved and redeemed, then you have been raised from spiritual death into newness of life, spiritual life. And that spiritual life that you have received from God makes you a great debtor to God. That's why you are a slave. Because you owe a debt to God for your life that you could never repay through the sacrificial blood of Jesus Christ. You belong to God. He bought you. He possesses you with his Holy Spirit. Your life is his. He fills you now with 
the presence of Christ and the Spirit of God so that you can walk in righteousness and goodness. And so as a result, because you belong to Jesus, obedience to him is not optional. It's imperative. It's essential. Paul says in Galatians 2.20 that we've been crucified with Christ. And therefore, it's no longer we who live, it is Christ who lives in us. And so our hearts have been remade to direct all of our energy, all of our effort, not to serving ourselves, but to serving Him. As slaves of God, it is our joyful burden to serve God. Now, it's for this reason that Peter follows verse 16 with four commands in verse 17. Here are some specific examples of what it looks like to serve God. First, honor everyone. To honor somebody means that you show them esteem or respect. And so how should we show people esteem or respect or honor? Well, the answer is because God is their creator. And in creating them, Scripture teaches us that God has imprinted upon every person His image. Every person that you know that you should treat with honor is an image bearer of God Himself. And so when we dishonor other people, when we trash them, when we treat them poorly, what are we actually doing? We are defaming the image of God. We dishonor the one who has made them. And so just like we must submit to the authorities who God has instituted because God is a higher authority above them, so too we should show honor to others because in honoring them, we honor the one who made them. Now, it is true that not all people deserve to receive honor or respect or esteem from us. Don't you know that from experience? But God does deserve honor and esteem and respect, doesn't he? And notice that Peter does not carve out any exceptions here. Doesn't that frustrate you? He doesn't say, honor everyone except the jerks. You know, those guys, they don't deserve it. Honor everyone, but not criminals. They've kind of forfeited that. Honor everyone, but not your enemies, because that just doesn't make sense. Peter doesn't say, honor people who are nice to you, honor people who are like you. Doesn't it frustrate you? He says, honor everyone. And this is why the Bible is a crazy, crazy book. Because it teaches things like this, and you know what? It actually means it. It really means it. That you should honor everyone. Because this is honoring to God. When you honor people... You honor the one who made them. And there's another reason why we need to do this as servants of God. And the reason is because what have you received from God? God has showed you honor. And you do not deserve any honor. You don't deserve to be shown esteem or respect. What you deserve from God is wrath and judgment for your sin. And yet, what has God done for you? He has honored you highly by giving his own son to redeem you, unworthy though you are. And if God has shown you that kind of honor when you do not deserve it, how dare you withhold that honor from somebody else? Don't you see how this works? It's not for their sake that we honor others. It's for his sake. The next command is love the brotherhood. Um, I actually think to love somebody is a loftier command than to merely honor them. Love carries with it self-sacrifice. It means that you are giving yourself over to the work of doing what's good for someone. You, in loving someone, should consider their needs even before your own needs. That might not be the case when you're honoring somebody and just showing them respect. Love is self-sacrificial. It requires patience and kindness. It requires that you relate to somebody with humility and truthfulness. 
You offer them forgiveness and even tenderness. I sincerely believe that the surest sign that somebody has really been truly converted, has really truly been born again, regenerate, raised from death to life, received a new heart from God, the truest proof that somebody really is a Christian is other-centeredness. As the Spirit of God moves in and makes the heart home, it banishes out self-centeredness. Sacrificial love for others is the proof of the Spirit of God because man in his natural fallen state, what is he? Selfish and self-centered and self-oriented and self-preserving. Man in his natural state only cares about his own needs and his own desires, fulfilling his own wishes, his own comfort and happiness. By nature, you and I are disgustingly egotistical and megamaniacal, narcissistic, until God changes our hearts. And the realest, truest proof of that change is that we consider others. Think about it this way. Think about other people taking center stage in the action of your life. Can you imagine that? That as the play of your life unfolds, it's not you as the superstar on the stage receiving all of the attention and applause, but you somehow fade away behind the curtain and others play the center role in the drama that unfolds around you. Now you might be looking at this command here in verse 17 and you're thinking, oh, but Grady, Peter only says love the brotherhood, right? I got an out. That nasty coworker of mine... I'm off the hook. Well, you're not because we can go to other places in Scripture. If you want the verse references, let me know after. But you know the Bible says, love your neighbor, love your enemy, pray for those who persecute you. So you're not off the hook. Peter here can zero in on love the brotherhood, but that doesn't mean that you're not obligated to show love to all people. But why does Peter focus on the brotherhood? In other words, love your fellow Christians. I'll tell you why. I think it's because loving the brotherhood should be easy. That part should be easy. Loving our enemies, I think that's hard. Loving your neighbor, that can be very difficult when their dog barks all night long on Saturday night. But it should be easy to love our brothers and sisters in Christ, shouldn't it? I mean, this is the place where we should have the freedom to practice loving one another well. Where we might occasionally fail and have to hear a rebuke, but still be loved. And you know what? If we can't get it right here in the church where it should be easy, then we are definitely not going to get it right when it comes to loving our enemies and our neighbors. So love the brotherhood so that you can grow in maturity and become the kind of person who puts others first. The church is where we can learn to practice love, where we can practice patience with one another, extending forgiveness, praying for one another, taking into consideration the needs of other. This is a place to learn to not be selfish so that when you go out there and everybody else is selfish, you can continue in behavior that looks like Christ. Next, we're told to fear God. The Greek word for fear here is where we get our English word phobia. Um, And this is a little bit of a tangent, I admit, but today Christians are slandered as being transphobic and homophobic and Islamophobic and all these other phobias, aren't we? And uh, the truth is, we don't fear people who are caught up in the sin of homosexuality or transgenderism. We are just opposed to their immorality. We think it's bad for them. But you know what? As Christians, there is a phobia we have or we should have. I'm going to coin this phrase, theophobia. Right? Like June Pride Month is coming up. I'm going to get a shirt that just says theophobic. 
Because that's what we should be. We should fear God. We fear the almighty judge of all the earth who will repay every person according to their deeds. God will repay you according to your deeds. We fear the all-wise God whose plan for salvation included the awful crucifixion of his own son for the redemption of man. We fear the all-powerful God who can cast the person both body and soul into hell. We fear the God who can speak the galaxies into existence and with a word can bless to build up or curse to destroy. That's what we should fear. We do not fear emperors. We do not fear kings. We do not fear judges or militaries or tyrants or despots. We certainly do not fear those who practice sexual immorality. We do not fear these things. We do not even fear the devil himself. We fear God. And we love him for his creative power and his wisdom and his justice and his might and his goodness and his righteousness and his authority. And it is because we fear God that we honor everyone and we love the brotherhood. And let me add here that if your Christian faith has not taught you to fear God, because all you've ever been told is that Jesus is this warm, fuzzy guy who likes to give out hugs and forgiveness, then you've been taught an incomplete Christianity. Jesus does love, and he offers warmth and tenderness and forgiveness and embrace. Praise God for the love and gentleness of Jesus Christ. Our God is a tender and merciful God, slow to anger. But he is also a just judge and a righteous ruler who takes sin and wickedness and evil very seriously. God is a terror to those who give themselves over to the abomination of evil. And it is good and right that we should fear God And it is good and right that we should love him and hold him in awe and reverence. And out of that fear of God and God alone, then Peter can tell us to honor the emperor. Not fear the emperor, honor the emperor as God's appointed servant. Now, Peter already told us, honor everyone. So why go back and say, honor the emperor? Why does he have to repeat the idea of honoring somebody? Well, I think when we connect this idea to a verse like 1, Corinth, or 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17, we can rightly conclude that those who are in authority actually deserve extra honor because they're appointed by God. And in deserving extra honor, they also carry with them extra responsibility before God. They will be judged by a stricter standard. But we are taught to honor the emperor and those who are in authority because in doing so, we honor God who placed them in that position of authority. We've already discussed that in detail. And so I would simply say, if you can't honor the emperor for his own sake because he's a wicked, immoral man, then look past the emperor and look to God. And honor the emperor for God's sake. Practically, what, was that, what, what might that look like? Well, it might mean that we quit complaining about the emperor. And instead, we pray for him. Complaining is a sin. Praying for leaders and authorities is a biblical command. So to honor the emperor would mean that we would pray for the emperor that we would pray for those in, power, in positions of power and authority, that they would repent, that they would believe, that they would be wise, that they would feel the burden of their responsibility before an almighty God who will hold them accountable for everything they do and say. Well, that brings us to the end of our verses, but I want to conclude with just a brief, again, reflection on the gospel, okay? Sometimes, here's how I like to think about the gospel. You're a human, and so you cannot do what the Bible says. 
But Jesus became a man to do everything the Bible says. And therefore, because Christ is in you, you can do everything the Bible commands. Do you see? Verse 16 says you should be a humble servant of God, but the truth is you can't because you're caught up in your own narcissism and self-centeredness. But then Christ became like you and served God faithfully. He had every right to be proud and self-centered, but instead he laid down his life like a servant. Mark chapter 10, verse 45, Jesus says that he came not to be served, but to lay his life down as a ransom. And because Christ has served you and filled you with his spirit and made you alive and like him, you are changed. His power is now in you to do what you could not do on your own. His character, his virtue, his love has been gifted to you. And so you are no longer a self-centered, narcissistic, miserable wretch. You are made in the image of Jesus Christ, other-centered, like Jesus. And so the truth is that with this new nature remade in the image of Christ, we can do everything Jesus commands us to do. We can live in the freedom of his love, seeking the things that please him. We can serve God and we can serve others, just like our Lord Jesus served. We can show honor to others because Christ in humility has shown us honor. We can love the brotherhood and our neighbors and our enemies because God has given his love to us. We can fear God because Christ bore the wrath of God. And gave us the love of God. And we can honor the emperor because we trust the one who has all authority. Above every authority. And who has made us citizens of the kingdom of God. And so all that we are and all that we need, it's found in Christ. And Christ is in us through the spirit of God. And so then let us live as servants who are free. Let me pray. God, we cannot do these things apart from you because we are slaves to sin. But I thank you that Christ, the Son of God, has set us free. And I pray that we would use this freedom not as a cover-up for evil, but to be servants obeying everything that you have commanded. Lord, we thank you that you empower us in this work. And I pray that as we live this life as servants of Christ, that the world would see and give glory to God as we honor everyone and we love the brotherhood. God, would you do this work in and through us. In Christ's name, amen.